Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Henry Greeley. He is currently the Dean F. and Kate Edelman Johnson Professor of Law and Professor by Courtesy of Genetics at Stanford University. He is also an elected Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He specializes in the ethical, legal, and social imp implications of the new biomedical technologies, particularly those related to neuroscience, genetics, or stem cell research. And today we're going to focus on his book, The End of Sex and the Future of Human Reproduction. So, Dr. Greeley, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you for asking me. I'm always happy to talk about this fascinating stuff. Yes, it's really fascinating. So my first question would be, uh, we are dealing here with a lot of different technologies that are all related to assisted human reproduction, correct? Huh? Is that a fair yes. assessment? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, in your book, you talk a lot about easy PGD, that is easy pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So this is a very complicated term. Could you please break it down for us and maybe tell us a little bit about the types of technology that it uh, implies? Sure, I'm happy to. Mm -hmm. The future I see is the result of two different areas of biotechnology or bioscience technology, each being powerfully developed in its own sphere, mm -hmm. um, interacting, intersecting, and interacting in somewhat unexpected ways. And where I think they're going to intersect is in this area of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD. Mm -hmm. PGD sounds to most people like science fiction. With PGD, you take one or a handful of cells from a human embryo, do genetic tests on those cells, and that allows you to decide, is that embryo going to get cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease? Is that embryo at high risk for breast cancer? The embryo isn't at risk for breast cancer. The embryo doesn't have breasts, but if the embryo is born as a child, grows up, becomes an adult woman, would it be at high risk? Is the embryo going to be male or female? Most people, as I say, think this is science fiction, but it has been in clinical use for almost 30 years. The oldest child born as a result of PGD is 29 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with PGD is that in order to do PGD, you have to use another acronym. You have to do IVF, in vitro fertilization. And the reason for that isn't any particularly great high-tech secret it's that if you're going to take some cells off of an embryo, you have to have the embryo. Mm -hmm. You have to know where the embryo is. And if you conceive the old-fashioned way through sex at days three to six after fertilization, that embryo is halfway down one of the woman's two fallopian tubes. Good luck finding it. If you conceive through IVF, the embryo is still in the same Petri dish you put it in. It doesn't move around. So it's really just the physical, the ability to physically grab the embryo that requires you to use IVF in order to use PGD. The problem is IVF is a pain. It's expensive, it's unpleasant, and it's somewhat risky. Now, it's not unpleasant or risky for the man. I don't know of any male who has been sent to the hospital as a result of giving a sperm donation. But egg harvest is involved, involves 30 or 40 days worth of very expensive, very powerful, very annoying shots of hormones. It's uncomfortable. And about half of 1% who go through, uh, about, and about half of 1% of all the women who go through it in a year in the United States end up in the hospital. Every once in a while, every few years, somebody dies as a result. Several people a year will lose their reproductive capacity. Now, that's out of 160 to 180,000 women. It's not very risky. It's probably less risky than walking around the Stanford campus at the time when the students are changing classes on their bicycles. 
but it is risky. As a result of the cost and the unpleasantness and the risk, no one does IVF unless they really have to. So there are about 3.8 million babies born last year in the United States. Of those, about somewhere around 80,000 were born as a result of IVF. A little over 1%, close to 2% were born as a result of IVF. Here are the two technologies that are going to change things. Mm-hmm. One is being able to make eggs from skin cells. So you and your listeners, viewers, right? They're, they're, these are viewers. Uh, listeners and viewers. Yes. Okay. So, so, so you and everyone else hearing me has probably heard about human embryonic stem cells. These were discovered about 20 years ago. They're really exciting because they can become every cell type in our body. They can become brain cells and liver cells and kidney cells and skin cells. And they beca- can become eggs and sperm. And we know that because you and me and every human being is the result of human embryonic stem cells. It's turned into us. About 12 years ago, in 2007, a Japanese scientist named Shinya Yamanaka figured out a way to take skin cells and turn them into things that look like embryonic stem cells that also can become every cell type. These have yet another acronym. These are IPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, and they can become brain cells, liver cells, kidney cells, and eggs and sperm. So rather than go through the unpleasant, expensive, and risky process of egg harvest, in the future, and I think this will be 15 to 35 years in the future, a woman will be able to give a small skin biopsy, about a half a millimeter wide, that will be turned into induced pluripotent stem cells. And those will be turned into eggs, fertilized with sperm, probably donated the old fashioned way, and turned into embryos. Um, One advantage of this, if you do egg harvest on a woman, on average you get 10 to 15 eggs. Sometimes you get 25, sometimes you get zero. If you make eggs through stem cells, how many eggs do you get? How many eggs do you want? 20, 100, 1,000, a million, just a question of how long you let the cell line divide. So that's one change, and probably the most important is making eggs from skin cells, which means you'll be able to avoid egg harvest, which means IVF will be a lot easier and cheaper and safer. The other change is being able to read DNA cheaply. So right now when you do PGD, well, historically when you did PGD, you could only look for one thing because genetic technology was expensive and slow. So you could see, does this embryo have or not have the gene for Huntington's disease? Is this embryo going to grow up to be a boy or a girl? But you couldn't ask a lot of questions. Now you can ask basically every question that genetics can answer. You can get the whole genome sequence every A, C, G, and T in that embryo's genome, you can do that today, but today it's still pretty expensive. It's maybe $10,000 per embryo. In the future, that's going to get cheaper. And so parents will be able to find out, parents will make, say, 100 embryos, Mm -hmm. do a whole genome sequencing on each of the embryos, and find out for each of those embryos everything genetics can tell them. That's less than most people think it is, but it's still a lot. There are about 6,000 nasty early onset genetic diseases. Each one is rare, but when you multiply rare times 6,000, you get about 1% to 2% of births. 1% to 2% of births all around the world are of children who have a genetic condition that could have been detected in advance. Mm -hmm. Second, you've got the later in life risks like breast cancer or Alzheimer's disease or colon cancer. Third, you've got cosmetic traits. We don't know much about these yet, but we know that hair color, eye color, skin color, they're genetic. We will learn more about what they are. So you could say from looking at the DNA of the embryo, this embryo is going to turn out to be a person who's about 1.8 meters tall, who has light brown hair, who has dark brown eyes, who has a straight nose, and who is able to grow good facial hair. 
Um, those cosmetic traits, we don't know those yet, but we will. They'll be able to learn a little bit about behavioral and personality traits. Mm -hmm. This is the one that scares people the most, learning about intelligence or sports ability or math ability or personality type. I think we won't be able to learn very much because this is so complicated. I think at best we'll be able to say this embryo has a 60% chance of being in the top half and a 13% chance of being in the top 10%. But of course, the 13% chance of being in the top 10% is an 87% chance of not being in the top 10%. But that's an open empirical question. And then the fifth and last thing parents will be able to know, the early diseases, later diseases, cosmetic traits, um, behavioral aspects, the last is the easiest, boy or girl. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of cheap whole genome sequencing along with making eggs through skin cells, will make PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, easier, cheaper, better, and as a result, I think, much, much more attractive. That's a long answer to your short question. But, uh, yes, but, but it, it, it's shorter it's, than the 320 pages of my book. So. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, there are several different things here that we can explore, but let me just ask you this first. Since the title of your book is The End of Sex and the Future of Human Reproduction, I mean, it's not literally about humans stop having sex, right? It's just that they, uh, if your predictions are correct, they won't need to have sex to reproduce. Correct. That's correct. So the book isn't as scary as the title sounds. <laughs> the, the strongest prediction in the book is that in 20 to 40 years, people will still have sex. They just won't have sex. Very Far, far fewer of them will have sex in order to make their babies. I mean, I've got two kids. I've had sex more than two times. Most of the times in my life I've had sex, it has had nothing to do with making babies. Um, that it's going to continue, but I think people, most people in rich countries, rich and middle class people in middle income countries, rich people in poor countries, I think are largely going to do this in most places in order to have healthier babies. That's what's going to drive it, is parents who want healthy babies. And parents wanting the best for their children is, is not a surprise. Um, and I think that's why once this becomes proven to be safe and cheap enough to be accessible, I think it's going to be widely used. Mm -hmm. But having said that, people will still have sex. There's, it's funny. There's, there's a bad pun in the title. Uh, any pun you have to explain is by definition a bad pun. End in English doesn't just mean the finish. It can also mean the purpose. Mm -hmm. So the end of sex, some people, including, for example, um, uh, the Vatican hierarchy, think that the purpose of sex is solely to for a married couple to have children. Mm -hmm. It is that end of sex, it is that purpose of sex that I think will end. So as, as I told you, it's a bad pun because it takes too much explanation, but the end of sex means two different things in the title. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. So, I mean, if there's anything about human relationships that we have to worry about when it comes to deploying this type of technology, easy PGD in this case, it's not about uh, exactly romantic relationships, but maybe how uh, familial relationships might change. I think, that, I think that's right. Um, you know, the official Catholic position is that um, sex within marriage is special and important because of its unitive nature. Um, and, and things that I, I don't, I have to confess, I don't really understand exactly what they're getting at. I think couples can grow closer by having sex even if they're not intending to have children. Um, we do have lots of examples right now of people who have babies in ways other than traditional sex. That's IVF. 
about 1% to 2% of babies born in the developed world are born as a result of IVF or artificial insemination. That's another, the numbers are less certain there, but that looks like another 1% or so of babies. So this isn't the first time we've done this, but I do think it will be more common, and it has the added difference of allowing parents to more directly choose the genetic traits of their kids. Before, you could kind of choose the genetic traits of your kids by choosing who to have kids with. If you have children with a really, really tall person, you're more likely to have tall children. If you have children with a really, really short person, you're more likely to have short children. But this allows more detailed choices, and that's disconcerting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, when it comes to PGD and applying it to try to reduce or eliminate even certain types of genetic diseases, uh, I guess that that bit is less controversial at face value, let's say. But when we go into the details, at a certain point there you say that we expect for that kind of technology to become cheaper and cheaper over time and so it would probably be accessible to more and more people over time. But uh, at least uh, in its initial phase, I mean, when it comes into the market, uh, wouldn't it be a risk, for example, if the people that are richer and have immediate access to it started eliminating certain types of disease that would still occur uh, in other people from lower socioeconomic status? For example? Ex exactly. One of, the, one of the five big areas of ethical issues this raises, I think, are issues of equality, mm -hmm. equity justice. I don't think within at least rich countries the socioeconomic issues are going to be huge for two reasons. One is PGD will not give you super babies. We don't know how to make super babies. And the best PGD, even easy PGD, can do is give people a choice of babies, some babies that have genes from each of them. So if you've got two people who are very, very short, they're not going to be able to make an embryo that will be very, very tall. They just won't have the genes to do that. We don't know genes for super babies. People using easy PGD, their children will be somewhat healthier. They will avoid those 6,000 nasty genetic early onset genetic diseases that hit one or two percent of the population of, of babies. Their children will be at less risk for Alzheimer's disease or certain cancers long term, but they're not going to be super people. The difference is not trivial, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I can't really explain how I quantify this because this is sort of my impression rather than a hard number, but I think kids made using easy PGD will probably be about 10% healthier than kids who aren't. If across the world, rich people's kids were 10% healthier than poor people's kids, that's a bad thing. It is almost certainly the case that rich people's kids are already more than 10% healthier than poor people's kids because of better food, better medical care, better attention, less exposure to various risks. Making that worse would be a bad thing. I think that in most countries that have higher or even middle income countries, um, PGD is likely to, easy PGD is likely to be free. Now that's sort of a bold statement. It obviously won't be free in the sense that there will be costs that somebody will have to pay. But I think governments or health carriers will pay them because it will make financial sense. Let's say you use easy PGD to make 100 babies. And let's say each baby using easy PGD costs $10,000. Might be $2,000, it might be $30,000, but I think $10,000 is a decent guess. That's a million dollars for 100 babies. It's a lot of money. 
If by doing that you avoid the birth of one child with a serious genetic early onset disease, you save three to six million dollars. So the healthcare financing systems will save money if people use EZPGD. It will also be the case that there'll be less human suffering. There'll be fewer children with serious diseases. There'll be fewer families disrupted by a child with a serious disease. There'll be less suffering. That's the main good thing about it. But from the accountant's perspective, of the people running these healthcare plans, um, that pales compared to the fact that it will save them money. So I think that it will be free in most countries with middle or upper income. That doesn't mean, though, there won't be inequalities. It'll be a long time before everybody in Burkina Faso or Laos or Paraguay gets easy PGD. Uh, the fact that it might be quite common in the U.S. or in Portugal or Brazil or in uh, China even uh, doesn't mean it'll be common all over the world. And we see that already with health issues. You know, poorer countries have less health care. Uh, this has the potential to make that worse, and that's something we should worry about and try to fix. Mm -hmm. So at a global level, probably it could be a bigger issue also in the sense that if we were to eliminate certain types of genetic diseases in people that are part of more developed countries, since disease is also a, a factor that plays a role in the economic development of a particular country, then, I mean, I guess that you know wh where I'm trying to arrive at, right? Yeah, um, it, that could be the, it's probably not going to be a huge factor because powerfully genetic diseases are pretty uncommon. Okay. So if you're only affecting 1% to 2% of the population directly and another 5% to 10% of the population through later term risks, you do much better for poor countries by eliminating some non-genetic diseases like malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria is a huge tax on uh, sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Southeast Asia. Beta thalassemia, very common in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Those affect far more people, but yes, if you fix genetic diseases or prevent genetic diseases in rich countries and not in poor countries that adds to the disadvantage of poor countries. I don't think it's nearly as big a, a factor as some other diseases. The other side of that is <laughs> almost all of the genetic research that's been done has been done on people of European ancestry. Okay. You people of European ancestry are maybe a quarter of the world's population mm -hmm. at most. Um, we know a lot about the particular genetic variations that cause some diseases in white people. We don't know nearly as much about which variations cause disease in black people or yellow people or red people. And that's another inequality that we have to worry about. Easy PGD at currently, and people are worried about this and working on it. But right now, EZPGD would work better for people of European ancestry than people of non-European ancestry, just because we know more about the genes. We need to fix that, too. Mm -hmm. Do you also worry about the potential impact that technologies like genetic engineering and probably the, the type of technology that people talk the most about nowadays is CRISPR-Cas9, and I've already had a couple of uh, bioethics professors on the show that talked about that kind of technology and it seems that it also has some of the problems that the other technologies that we talked about here have like it's not it's still not cheap enough and it has some risks associated with it because it might cut in certain places that are not the target ones and might insert genes in wrong places and things like that. So, I mean, the specificity of it, it's still not high enough to be uh, secure, let's say, to at least to use in humans. Uh, 
Yep. But when we get there, and we will probably do, uh, I mean, do you worry about the impact that that technology might have also? Yes and no. I do worry about it. And in fact, I'm trying desperately to finish a manuscript for a book about the CRISPR babies mm -hmm. from China. Um, the um, I do think that the safety issues with respect to human babies are, ser are serious enough that it's several decades away. I think easy PGD is closer because the safety risks are smaller. They're not zero, but they're smaller. They have to be dealt with, but they will be sooner. My view on crispr babies or crispr embryos is a little bit unusual. I actually don't think it's likely to be a big deal because almost everything a couple would want to do through crispring their embryos that we know how to do, they can do through easy PGD. So if you know that you and your partner both carry uh, one copy of the gene that causes sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis, you could make embryos and use CRISPR to try to change the, the sick embryos into healthy embryos. Mm -hmm. Or you could use easy PGD and make embryos and just choose the embryos that don't have two bad copies of the gene. Mm -hmm. For almost everybody, PGD will be an adequate substitute for gene editing for anything that involves only one gene. When you get into conditions that involve 10 genes or 20 genes or 100 genes or 1,000 genes, which is probably what you're looking at in terms of intelligence, easy PGD is not going to help. You can't make enough embryos to get the right combination in each of a thousand places. It's, it's just the odds are very, very much against it. CRISPR gene editing could do that, and it might sometime in the future, but right now we don't know what those thousand genes are. And each one is going to have a small effect this is something I think my grandchildren may have to worry about, um, but I don't have any grandchildren yet, so uh, I think it's I think I think the big potential use and what scares people about gene editing, what scares people about gene editing fundamentally isn't disease prevention, it's enhancement, yes. it's Superman, it's a speciation event, mm -hmm. it's turning us into two species, and that makes for great science fiction much of what I've, which I've read and enjoyed. Um, but in terms of how human genetics works, that's a long way off and may never come. Uh, because especially when it comes to, to intelligence, to things going on in our brains, our brains, genetics is complicated. Neuroscience is about a thousand times more complicated. Uh, we just don't understand, and we may never understand all the things that go into affecting what we call intelligence. So I do worry about it. I don't worry about it as much as some people with respect to humans. I worry about it mainly, and this is my third book. Once I get done with the next one, the third book, which is going to be called Playing With Life, is about what we can do, what we are likely to do to the non-human world, because we care a lot about the safety of babies. We don't care so much about the safety of cattle. We care a little bit but not hugely. We don't care at all about the safety of rats or of mosquitoes. So we're likely to do things much sooner, faster, and more dramatically with non-human organisms than we are with human organisms. And there's a good chance, I think, that we will make mistakes and mess things up. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm mainly worried about CRISPR in the non-human world, at least for the next 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so what do you think when people or certain people, for example, I think that I've heard uh, Yuval Harari, for example, talking about this, when they say that it is a re that genetic engineering in the future is a risk because, uh, I mean, people might use it to enhance certain abilities like intelligence, personality, etc. I mean, psychological traits. Right. Uh, do you think then that because we are talking about mostly polygenic traits that uh, and their genetics is really, really complex, 
because it is very risky to do so and will be because if, for example, we were to change 10 genes to increase the expected IQ by two or three points, for example, yep. if, if that would increase the probability of the person being predisposed to certain I don't know, diseases or brain malfunctioning, like, for example, brain cancer. Right. Do, you, do you think that people, doctors and parents and so on, wouldn't be, uh, I mean, careful about that? And, and even because those kinds of technologies have to be approved before they get into the market. I mean, don't you think that that would be really hard to expect in the near future? Yes, I don't expect to live to see it. I don't expect you to live to see it. Um, <laughs> my children might live to see it, but I think these traits are not just polygenic, they're multigenic. You're talking about not just three or four or six or eight genes, you're talking about hundreds of genes. Yeah. Um, I think regulators need to be careful to make sure that things are only allowed if they are proven safe and effective. Mm -hmm. I think that parents and doctors need to be very concerned about this. I think the point you make about other consequences is crucial and not, not accepted enough, not thought about enough. When Hu Zhongkui changed the CCR5 genes of those embryos that led to the birth of the two babies, he did it to knock out that gene so that they couldn't get infected with HIV. Well, for one thing, the man should rot in prison. It was a desperately reckless, stupid uh, experiment. For one thing, it just reduces their risk of HIV infection. It doesn't prevent it. There are other methods beyond CCR5 that the virus uses to infect cells. But even more importantly, we don't know what life is like for people who don't have good CCR5 cells, genes. We know some of them live into their 50s and 60s. There's some evidence, so far it's limited evidence, that they're at higher risk for death from the flu or from West Nile virus. Um, what we, we don't know what the effects are of changing all these things. And before we try to use it widely, we should know what those risks are. And that's a lot of research. Um, the problem is... I, I think of human populations in almost every respect as bell curves. And so there's some people who are very, very risk averse and would never try anything new with their kids. Yeah. But I live in Silicon Valley that has a lot of people at the other end of the risk curve who say, ooh, it's new, it's flashy, it's exciting, I want it, let's do it now. So there will be people who will be reckless. I think I trust parents for the most part not to be reckless with their children. Most parents, I think, really love their children and want the best for them. Yeah. But, it, but it's a big world, and there are a lot of different people. Some crazy people become parents. So some people will be willing to try this way too soon, and some children will be damaged as a result. And that's something we need to worry about and try to limit or prevent as far as we can. But already, you know, there are, there are stem cell clinics that are complete frauds that are selling quackery. And there are people paying them $50,000, $100,000 for things that have no medical, medically proven value. Desperate people will try desperate things, and there are people who are willing to make money off them. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's talk a little bit now about the politics and the possible social consequences of easy PGD. So, uh, I mean, there are several different things where it could be applied, like, for example, uh, as we've already talked about, uh, in, uh, enhancing some non-disease traits, uh, sex selection, uh, selecting for a disability. In your book, you also talk about uni parents. I yes. mean, le le let's talk about that bit, about uni okay. parents. Well, that's uh, the... what, what's that about and what would you say would be some of the possible social consequences of it? Sure. Um, the uniparent is one of the, is maybe the weirdest idea in this book. And I have to confess, I didn't think about it. I was presenting it, presenting a version of the story 
to my colleagues in a seminar, and one of my law school colleagues said, well, what would happen if I did this? The idea is, if you can take skin cells and make them into eggs, and you can take skin cells and make them into sperm, maybe you can take skin cells from a man and make them not just into sperm, but also into eggs. And maybe you can take skin cells from a woman and make them not just into eggs, but make them into sperm. That's not been done yet in mice. The making eggs and sperm has been done in mice and has led to healthy mice. Why would you want to do that? Well, gay and lesbian couples would want to do that so they could have a baby that was genetically theirs. But, said my colleague, what if I made skin cells, took skin cells from me and we made eggs and we made sperm and we used my sperm to fertilize my eggs and then we found a woman who was willing to carry it as a surrogate, what would that baby be? Um, I, that, that was an egomaniacal uh, position that had not occurred to me, uh, but I'm, I'm glad I could count on my colleagues for uh, expressing the full range of human reactions. I call it a unibaby and a uniparent. It's, it, it's not a clone. It's interesting. People's first reaction is, well, that's like cloning. Yeah. Except if you've got the same form, almost all of our genes we have in pairs, one from our mother, one from our father. Mm -hmm. So if you're blood type O, you have two copies of the blood type O gene. Um, and if you made a unibaby, making a sperm from yourself and an egg from yourself, that unibaby would also have to be blood type O because all it can get is an O gene. That's all the genes you can give it. If you are blood type A, because you have one A gene and one O gene, mm -hmm. that makes you blood type A. Mm -hmm. But your unibaby could have two A genes and be blood type A. It could have one A gene and one O gene, like you, and be blood type A. Or it could have two O genes and be blood type O. So every place, and using the scientific jargon, every place you're homozygous, you've got the same version. The baby would be like you. Every place you're heterozygous, you've got two different versions. The baby might or might not be like you. I don't think <laughs> this, uh, this doesn't strike me as a very attractive way to reproduce. I don't think a lot of people would do it. Um, I ask myself, who would want to do this? And the answer is a rich egomaniac. But there are rich egomaniacs out there. Some of them are even famous. Um, would Donald Trump want to make a kid this way? Maybe. I don't think there will be enough children this way to make it to have much effect on society, but it is one of the weirder examples, and it's it's an example of something that a, po a society might decide to ban. It might say, okay, you can use EZPGD for these things, but you can't use it for this. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that part about banning. Uh, I mean, what do you think are some of the aspects of easy PGD or the types of scenarios where it could be applied that people would most easily want to ban or at least to regulate? Sure. Uh, let me approach it from the other direction. Um, I think the one that's most attractive is preventing disease. Okay. Most places... I think would understand and would allow easy PGD for disease prevention. We actually have some precedents for this from Europe. Um, for old fashioned PGD, both Italy and Germany basically had banned it and courts said you can't ban it for people for whom it's the only way they can avoid having children with a genetic disease. Mm -hmm. So you have to allow people to use it to avoid genetic disease. I think that's a very powerful impulse. But I can imagine countries saying you can't use it to pick eye color or hair color or skin color. <coughs> you can't use it to try to pick intelligence or math ability or music ability. You can't use it for enhancement. Uh, you can't use it to pick boy or girl. Mm -hmm. I think there are different countries that would take any of those positions. Different countries have different cultures that will accept different things. Um, I think it will be, you know, Germany, because of its history, is very averse to any kind of human genetics. It's likely to take a very restrictive view of this, as it did with PGD. Uh, China uh, or California 
you know, we're much more wide open uh, and open to other things. Latin America seems to me interesting in a lot of reproductive things. It's very, very conservative, but it's sort of conservative on the books, but not necessarily in reality. Um, so, for example, Brazil has very, very stringent anti-abortion laws, but Brazil has lots and lots and lots of abortions. So I don't know how Latin America uh, would would pan out. Different countries, the point, though, is just that different countries are likely to react in different ways. The weirder and less apparently justifiable something is, like unibabies, there's no good reason to have a unibaby. I think the more likely it is to be banned. The more people can understand and say, this is a good reason like preventing disease. I think the more likely it is countries will allow it. Different countries will allow different things. That of course raises the possibility of what's called reproductive tourism. If um, if Colombia doesn't allow it, but Mexico does, take a trip from Colombia to Mexico. Who knows that you're going to come back carrying an embryo? It's very hard for the customs officials to spot that and confiscate it as contraband. So uh, I think there will be different systems, different positions taken in different parts of the world, but they will be mitigated to some extent by the possibility of people traveling in order to get something in one country that they can't get in their home country. The other really important thing I'd say about this, though, is these ethics questions, they work at two levels. One is, what does the country think? What does the country want? What do you want for your society? Which in a way means, what is it that you think no one else should be able to do? Mm -hmm. But there's also always the personal level. Do I want to do this or not? Do I think this is a good idea for me and my family and my loved ones? People can have different views on those two levels. I mean, for example, I hate smoking and tobacco. I would never smoke. I will be incredibly angry at my children if they smoke. My father died from lung cancer as a result of smoking. Um, but I don't think the U.S. should ban smoking because I think that would just make things worse. You can be opposed to something for yourself but still say, but my reasons are my reasons and they're not strong enough for me to want to prevent everybody from doing it. So there are moral issues here at the personal level and at the social level, and people need to remember those are two different questions. What you would do versus what you think your society sh should allow. Mm -hmm. And aren't, isn't there another set of ethical questions here having to do with the consequences that uh, parents' choices might have later on in their children's lives and even, for example, they might make uh, they might make some choices that even though they are apparently uh, harmless uh, i mean later on their children might find out that uh, their parents tweaked with some aspects of their bodies let's say that right. they don't like and i mean do you think that we should take seriously that later on some children might decide that uh, it would be in their right to legally move against their parents because of some uh, decision that they made when it comes to their genetics particularly. So Ricardo, are you a parent? Uh, no, not yet. When you become a parent, you, you are a child, you're somebody's, you had parents. Sure. Your parents made a lot of decisions that have led to you being sitting behind uh, that computer screen with those microphones. We make, as parents, we make lots of decisions that affect our children's lives and futures unpredictably. We think we're doing the right thing. We think that having them take violin lessons at age four is a perfect thing, but it turns out to cause them to hate music. Um, we think that having them play soccer is a good thing until they get a concussion by running into the, the goal, running into the post, and then it's a bad thing. Parents cannot help but make decisions that have irreversible and unpredictable effects on their children. Will children sue? Maybe. It's a big world. There are a lot of people in it, and um, will they 
is a suit about you picked this gene because you thought it would protect me from malaria, but instead it gave me a higher risk of diabetes. Is that likely to be a winning lawsuit? Probably not, I think, because parents, if they act reasonably, they're trying to do the best for their kids. But it, it is, it's an inevitable fact of life that um, we don't know what we're doing as parents. It's terrifying because you don't know how, you, you do the best you can, you make the decisions that seem best at the time. You don't know how they're going to turn out. Uh, and that's true of every aspect of parenting, including genetic choices. The, uh, the one thing that is certain is if you are a parent, at some point you will have teenagers, and the teenagers will be sure that everything you did was wrong <laughs> because that's what teenagers are like. <laughs> Most of them grow out of it eventually. Yes, yes I, I was just wondering if there wasn't a somewhat of a big difference, ethically speaking, between uh, a decision that you leave to chance, so let's say people usually reproduce and they don't know uh, the type of children that they will have or that, right. would re that will result from that act and they can't uh, decide on what traits they will alter or not. Uh, and I mean, you know what I mean, but on the other hand here, we are talking about people deliberately making certain decisions about what their children will be like. So I'm, isn't that a big I'm, difference? I'm glad you asked that question because it's such an interesting issue. Mm -hmm. um, first, let me note, P Easy PGD will not give you a designer baby. It won't give you a baby that's exactly what you want. There will be a few issues where you'll have power, uh, but you know, 98% of that baby is still going to be unpredictable to you. You'll just be able to predict it's not going to get this disease, this disease, this disease, and maybe you'll be able to predict its hair color and eye color. But most of it, like any baby, again, any parent who's had more than one child realizes how unpredictable children are. Because the second one is never like the first, uh, never the same as the first, even though you think you're doing everything the same. But I, I think this question of choice and responsibility is really intriguing. In theory, you don't have to be that good at making decisions to be better than chance. It's not like you have to make decisions perfectly. You just have to make decisions better than the random chance that nature uses which, you know, um, those 1% to 2% of babies born with genetic diseases, you can avoid that. That's better than random chance. And yet it feels to us because we make a decision that we have more responsibility if anything should go wrong. Mm -hmm. If you choose, if you make the decision not to make a decision, not deciding is a form of deciding. If you decide to just roll the dice and have babies the old-fashioned way, the chance, if anything goes wrong, why is that that you could have prevented? Why aren't you responsible for that as well? But it feels different. I think it goes to this deep cultural sense that actions are morally more significant than omissions. That yes. acting puts you at, at greater moral uh, risk than not acting. And that is a very powerful intuition that's very broadly held. I don't think it's logical at all, and I fight against it. Not acting is as much of an action as acting, and you should be responsible for the consequences of your inactions as well. But, but that's that's my view is a minority view. Uh, so I think it's an interesting area where I think there's a good logical argument that you're better off if the results are likely to be better. Taking the responsibility and making decisions is better than rolling the dice. But lots of people feel that somehow you've got more responsibility if the decision, if an affirmative decision you made had bad consequences, as opposed to a negative decision you made, a decision not to do something had bad consequences. And that's that's to me intriguing and puzzling that people feel that way. Okay, let me just ask you one last question. 
after all of what we've talked about, uh, would you say that e easy PGD, if it really happens, will be overall a positive or a negative thing in people's lives? So if it really happens is a really good point. Um, it's always hard. It, so Niels Bohr, the physicist, famously said, it's always hard to predict things, especially the future. Uh, he was wrong. It's easy to predict the future. It's just hard to be right about it. <laughs> so I made predictions. The thing I'm most confident about is the world will not turn out exactly the way I predicted it. But I do think we will almost certainly see much greater use of genetics in childbearing, in human reproduction. I think easy P I still think easy PGD is very likely to happen and be important. I think that there are lots of different pathways, but most of them, in most of them, I believe it will on balance be a good thing because it will limit some genetic diseases, some risks of other diseases. It will lead to healthier people, happier people. It will lead to less human suffering. Could it go wrong? Yeah. There could be scientific mistakes in it. There could be political mistakes in it. I, you know, my state, California, mandatorily sterilized 30,000 people between 1930 and 1960 as part of a deeply immoral and scientifically wrong-headed eugenics program. I could imagine a country, probably not going to say probably not a Western democracy, but I'm not sure where Western democracies are going these days, but I could imagine, say, an autocratic country that said, everybody has to use this, and you've got to pick the genes that the government wants, including the genes that in increase the likelihood of love of the dear leader. There will not be genes for love of the dear leader, but the dear leader will think there will be genes for love of the dear leader. That's a, that's a dystopian, terrible turn that this could take. I think, though, when I look over the history of humans and technology, in general, we have not made the best of it, but we've also avoided the worst of it. We tend to muddle through. So we've had genetic selection through prenatal testing and abortion for about 50 years now. It hasn't always been used well, but it hasn't led to terrible, terrible dystopian things. Some things have been bad, some things have been good, but on balance, it's led to less human suffering. Um, I think we have, we, nobody writes stories, nobody writes books or makes movies about a future where a new technology leads to some challenges, but people muddle through okay. They don't do perfectly, but they don't do terribly, because there's no drama in that. Our fiction has a bias toward drama, and drama likes conflict. So our fiction is very dystopian, leads to terrible futures, and that's, those are useful warnings, but in our real life we tend to muddle through, and I think that's what we're likely to do, and this is likely to lead to less human suffering, and to me that means I would, I would support it, although frankly the book is not so much an argument in favor of it. I try to lay out both sides and I tell people, because it's true, it's not my decision, it's your decision. If this becomes available, do you want to use it? Do you want your family to use it? That's your decision, not mine. Um, but I think on balance, if, we're, if we don't screw up, this will be a good thing. It won't be utopia. Utopias are also unrealistic. But I don't think it's going to be 1984 or... Um, Organic, brave new uh, world, or brave something new like world. That. right, yeah. right. Like most things, it'll be somewhere in between. <laughs> okay, so let's end on that note, Doctor Greeley. Just before we go, uh, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the internet if they want to get in touch with your work? And by the way, a little bit about your next book, if you want. Sure. Thank you. Um, I actually don't have much of a good website. The law school has a website for me. Uh, I also am on Twitter pretty regularly and giving, spending too much time giving my opinions on things that I don't know that much about. But in general, um, 
I recommend the book, uh, The End of Sex. The next book doesn't quite have a title yet. I think it's going to be called CRISPR People, and it's about using CRISPR to edit embryos. Its main focus is on the Hu Kui case, the Chinese scientist who made two babies and announced them last year. Uh, and my assessment of that, but also what we should, as as societies and as morally acting individuals, what we should think about and do about those, about that kind of gene editing going forward. And I hope that that will be available sometime in the fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will be looking forward to that book because I really love The End of Sex and I recommend it to all my listeners and viewers. And uh, let me just leave another invitation on the table for next year to hopefully to talk about your next book because I really love this one. So, Dr. Greeley, thank you a lot for well, taking the time to come on the show. Ricardo, I, I really enjoyed the conversation and obrigado. Thank you for having me. Okay, obrigado. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jakob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart. My three producers is our web, Rosie and Jim Frank, and my executive producer, Mikal Ruzieski. Thank you for all.